Hello again everyone! We're back for our final video on uniformly continuous functions and in this video we're going to prove that whenever you have a continuous function on a compact domain it is automatically uniformly continuous. Uh, the title it would be the same as the name of the theorem which will be the same essentially as the statement of the function so we're just gonna jump right into the proof why not? Okay, now we're going to prove this by contradiction, meaning what we're going to do here is we're going to write down some function on a compact domain which is continuous and assume that it's not uniformly continuous. Okay, so we'll assume f from d to r is continuous. We're going to assume that d is compact. And f is not uniformly continuous. Okay, so what's the difference, right? Well, with uniform continuity, you had to be able, right, for any epsilon to choose a delta that only depended on the epsilon, not on some whatever point in the domain, right, that you were you were talking about, right? There was no notion of uniform continuity at a point. It's uniform across the entire domain D. Uh, now, in the last video, we actually wrote down a theorem, we called it the sequential failure of uniform continuity. Uh, well, we didn't actually use the word theorem, we used the word porism. Okay? It actually came from our proof uh, of the sequential characterization of uniform continuity. And what it said is, if we know that f is not uniformly continuous, then, okay, what does this imply? There exists some epsilon star, greater than zero, and two d sequences that are equiconvergent okay so and there exist x dot and y dot remember this symbol here means equiconvergent which means that the difference of x and y converges to zero so these are going to be d sequences such that if i look at the f image of these sequences at any value Right at any point, right? So anywhere, uh, f of x k, f of y k, whatever. That this is always at least epsilon star. Okay, so this is for all k at least one. Okay, so I can just never get the f images of these two sequences to get really close to each other. All right. Now we're assuming d is compact, but compact that means d is closed and d is bounded. Ah, so this, say this sequence here, x dot, it's a D sequence. D is a bounded set. And if you ever have a sequence in a bounded set, then we know by bolzano weierstrass that we get a convergent subsequence. Okay, so by bolzano weierstrass x dot, which, again, we know that x and y are equiconvergent, but we don't know that either one of them converges, right? So we can't just assume, well, yeah, of course x is a, has a limit. No, we don't know, but it must have a convergent subsequence. So this has a convergent subsequence, and we'll denote that x n dot. Okay, and of course this is also a d sequence, right? Since x was a d sequence. All right, well, now, what about this y dot? Well, let's say I wanted to compute, um, well, let's try something for a minute, okay? This is not actually going to work, okay? So uh, don't write this down too carefully yet. If I take the limit of y dot, I mean, I don't even know that this exists, right? But let's just pretend for a moment I did. I want to write down the following. I take the limit of y dot minus x dot plus x dot. Okay, that, that uh, shouldn't do too much to change things. And then I would like to use the algebra of limits theorem to break this up as the limit of y dot minus x dot, oh, this is equal, plus the limit of x dot. And because x dot and y dot are equiconvergent, I know their difference has a limit of zero. 
Okay, and so then I'd just be able to write here the limit of x dot. But again, we don't know that x dot and y dot even converge at all. So saying that y dot and x dot have the same limit is not terribly helpful. Furthermore, this step right here is entirely suspect because this is where we wanted to use the algebra of limits, which says we have additivity, for example. And so if I have a limit of a sum, it's the sum of the limits. But that theorem assumed that each of the individual limits, in this case, the y dot minus x dot and the x dot exist. Now we already know the y dot minus x dot limit exists, so that's not the problem, but we don't know anything about this x dot limit. So what we're doing here doesn't really make sense, okay? However, if I go back and say, well, instead of looking at the entire sequence y dot, we look at the corresponding subsequence y n dot. When I say corresponding, I mean take the subsequence n dot and just look at those particular values for y dot. So if I come back in here and make this y n dot and all these dots, I turn them into n dots, n dot, n dot, n dot, n dot, n dot, and n dot. Well, let's check this argument again. Okay, the first step, there was no problem. But to use this next equality, I want to use the algebra of limits theorem, which required us to know that each of these individual limits existed. But because x dot minus y dot or y dot minus x dot converges to zero, then any subsequence also has to converge to zero. Okay, well, that's there. We have a subsequence, yn dot minus xn dot. So this works. And now we assumed that xn dot was a convergent subsequence. So this limit exists. Okay, so this equality makes sense now. This limit is still zero. And we actually know that yn dot and xn dot have the same limit. Since they have the same limit, we give it a name. Okay, so let's set the limit xn dot to be z. Okay, and this will be the same as the limit of yn dot. All right, now what did we know about f? Ah, f was continuous, right? We have not used that it's continuous yet. So since f is continuous, well, it's continuous on all of d. And, ooh, is z there? Oh, that's a good question, right? Do we actually know that the z is even in d to begin with? Ah, but this is where it's going to be so helpful that we had a compact set. Not only do we know that it's bounded, we also know it's closed, which means that when we have a convergent D sequence like xn dot, we know that the limit of that sequence must be in D because D contains all of its limit points. Okay, so here all of these are in D. Okay, but f is continuous on D, so f is continuous at z. Okay, what does that tell us? Well, by our sequential characterization of continuity, we know that if I apply f to z, that this will be the same thing as applying f to, say, the limit of xn dot. And the continuity tells me that I can swap the f and the limit. So this becomes the limit of f of xn dot. And similarly, f of z will be the same as the limit of f of y n dot. Okay, so both of these limits exist, and so now I'm just going to subtract them. So this tells me that the limit of f of y n dot minus f of x n dot is equal to zero. And this is a problem. This is a problem because up above we showed that the difference between f of some xk and yk was always at least as big as epsilon star for all k. All right, we can go out as far as we like in, in x and y, and f is never going to get them any closer than epsilon star. So it is not possible for the limit 
to be zero for the difference of f applied to both y n dot and x n dot. So this is a contradiction. Okay, and where does this contradiction come from? Well, we had assumed that we could find some continuous function on a compact domain that was not uniformly continuous, and we clearly cannot. All right, next time we make our way into the derivative. We'll see you there.